ain't see me, you see me wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie and make it look easy. Ladies, gentlemen, and MBs, we are joined today with a very special guest. Uh, we are joined today by the creator of a lot of my favorite things. Uh, <laughs> a lot of my favorite things, actually. Uh, uh, not only the creator of uh, you know, things like Gargoyles, but also has you know, had a hand in the creation of things like Young Justice, Star Wars Rebels, pretty much anything that, if you are someone my age, your childhood very likely revolved around in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Greg mm -hmm. Wiseman, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> anytime, anytime. So, you know, I, I want to, I just, I want to get the gushing out of the way first, so we can actually like you, know, uh, uh, talk business. But I uh, yeah. just wanted to say, you are a genius, and we'll, uh, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll put it there. <laughs> Thanks. Um. So we got you here today because you've been doing some really awesome stuff as of, uh, you know, just with Gargoyles, bringing the IP back, almost like a, like we, we got that revival that I think fans always kind of wanted, but just we never really got. And we got it in comic book form at Dynamite, and it's been lights out. Every issue has been fantastic. And now we're we're kind of building up to something huge right now. Uh, now that we've had Gargoyles, we've had Gargoyles Dark Ages, and now we have Gargoyles Quest coming up. Mm -hmm. Like, so just to kind of, you know, give everybody kind of a, a, an idea of, you know, how we got to this point, like, how did the, this whole thing come together? The, the, the perfect storm to bring Gargoyles back into the limelight? Honestly, that's probably a question for the folks at Dynamite. Uh, <laughs> they, uh... I, I'm not trying to be cagey. I just don't <laughs> know how they made the, they made some overall deal mm -hmm. with, because as I know, you know, they're also doing, they've done Hades and, and Darkwing Duck and, yes. and uh, um, I know they're doing a Hercules one coming up. So they've got mm -hmm. some kind of overall license. I don't even know what it all includes. <laughs> um, Scar, Barella, oh, yeah. um mm -hmm. And uh, I guess included in that was Gargoyles. And um, my editor, Nate Cosby, uh, and I'm forever grateful to him for this. You know, he contacted me and uh, through a friend, Chris Jones, and asked me if I'd be uh, interested in writing the book. And I said, yes, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, and then later I said to him, um, who else were you considering if I had said no? And he said, I didn't have anyone else on my list, which also <laughs> honestly made me feel good. <laughs> um, you know, because the truth is I created the show, but um, I don't own it. Disney, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. isn't, you know, beholden to me in any way. Um, certainly not legally or financially. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, they don't have to ask me to do it i'm thrilled that they did and i i like to think it's perhaps a little immodest but i like to think the book is better for me being involved um and it's just been great i mean i've uh, the audience hasn't seen them all yet but i've written 12 issues of gargoyles a halloween special six issues of dark ages and i'm in the middle of the fourth issue out of five of writing quest so i'm a ways ahead of where the readers are, but um, I just got today my comp oh. copy of Dark Ages 6, um, which I'm thrilled to see finally. And uh, <laughs> I wrote it so long ago, but, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, so Dark Ages is coming to a conclusion, which Dark Ages was our prequel series set um, before even the flashback episodes of uh, Gargoyles. And then we have 12 issues of Gargoyles with issue 12 coming out, I think in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's set in our present, which is 1997. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that follows 
both uh, the end of the second season of the show and the uh, run of comics I did at Dynamite, um, not Dynamite, at uh, SLG back in uh, 2007 and eight, something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, so all these comics are, from my point of view, completely canon and in continuity with the show. And um, uh, it's just been a blast for me to be able to get back to these characters and tell more stories with them. But honestly, I don't know how the deal got set up. I just mm. know that Nate contacted me and I said yes about as quickly as <laughs> anyone's ever said yes to anything in their lives. So. <laughs> Did, didn't even finish the sentence. D- Garg, g- done. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and honestly, that's been the thing recently. Like, uh, I, I'm also doing a, a comic for Marvel, which comes out this week. Uh, uh, spectacular Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. And my editor there, Nick Lowe, he's uh, called, you know, called me up and said, so I've got this book. It's going to feature both uh, Peter and Miles. I'm like, yes. And we've got Umberto Ramos to draw it. I'm like, yes. Um, and <laughs> he's like trying to talk me into it. I'm like, dude, dude, you had me at the word spy. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If it had turned out to be Spy Smasher, I still would have probably done the book. But uh, <laughs> but I was pretty sure there was a Durman coming after yeah. that. But, uh, uh, you know, it's one of these things where, uh, and this is not my history in comics at all, but recently it's just people keep offering me things that there's no way I'd ever say no to. I mean, it's just <laughs> so exciting. So um, I love Spider-Man, love Gargoyles. Obviously, Gargoyles is my baby. But, uh, uh, you know, can't think of uh, two other titles I'd rather be involved in than, than Gargoyles <laughs> and Spider-Man. Well, I mean, it has to feel really good that, that of course, Spider-Man is Spider-Man. But to know that so many people are anticipating this book, knowing that you're the one that has the pen in his hand, that has to be just a, a <laughs> big a feeling as Gargoyles. I mean... I, for one, even though I am a huge Spider-Man fan, knowing that Greg Wiseman is going to be writing it, let me just tell you right now, shit's getting bought. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting read, you know, but just off the strength of of, of your name alone, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and... I, I mean, I'm flattered by that. I, you know, I, I will say that um, the original title for the book was Spider-Man and Spider-Man, mm-hmm. and I said, guys, um, if you want to make more money. Let's call it the Spectacular Spider-Men. Um, <laughs> and I said, just Greg Weissman attached to a Spider-Man book that's got the word spectacular in it. I said, it's a bit of a cheat because we're not, we're not really doing a continuation of the TV show right. um, that I produced. But, you know, tonally, there's going to be similarities. And, and uh, so having me attached to a book it was spectacular spider anything um i said that's gonna sell more copies and you know we're all in this to you know make a little scratch so uh <laughs> let's let's do that i mean creatively it's exciting for me but i don't mind making money either um and uh and so they agreed and, and we changed the title uh the truth is is that um on the on spider-man uh i'm glad i'm a draw but when you see what umberto's drawn for this book um i'm definitely in fall down into second position because <laughs> it's so, well, the is so, no slouch either so i mean yeah that's my point i mean it, it's like i like to think i've written a good uh, uh you know a good storyline here good dialogue all that stuff good characters and then yeah, and it's sort of like you know with Umberto drawing it I might as well be I could have written a shopping list and people would buy this book because uh it's so gorgeous it really is and honestly <laughs> even on the Gargoyles books I've been really blessed with the artists on those two George Cambodeus has done an amazing mm-hmm. job on Gargoyles mm-hmm. um uh, yeah Drew, Drew Moss on Dark Ages Drew Moss uh, has mm-hmm. done fantastic just work on uh Dark Ages and Pasquale's work on uh um quest is uh, I've, I've only seen a bit of 
I haven't seen all of that yet, but uh, mm-hmm. what I've seen so far is just looking great. So l- let me ask you this: uh, leading into Quest, because you know we've had a you know I think was it because yeah I looked it up so issue twelve it looks like it comes out this week uh, uh, for uh, the the core title of uh, Gargoyles and like building up that we've had a lot of wild stuff going on Dark Ages we've kind of seen like a I almost kind of feel like you know, it's like a Demona begins uh you know sort of deal and we don't really get a lot of her in the core series but we do get a lot of her in dark ages so i i wanted to ask with everything that's been going on like this is obviously demona's story and you know, or, you know yeah and we know that they're uh you know her goal is the you know, the uh what she refers to as the 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 three new keys of power like without because you know, obviously, you know, this is part of this this core part of the story, so we don't want to spoil anything. But like, can you give us any hint of uh, what it is she's going to be looking uh, for in these three keys of power? Uh, I'm I'm not going to say what they are, mm-hmm. but I, I I'm happy to say what her overall plan is, which is mm-hmm. that you know um, she's got a bit of a gripe with uh, the human race um and we're terrible people um, so i I totally understand right i get it you know (laughs) (laughs) i think it's very 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 relatable um (laughs) but uh so you know uh she's tried in the past to shall we say genocide the hell out of us all um and failed um so she's got a new plan and it's a you know, it's not a, uh, Demona always has long-term plans and short-term plans. It's one of the things about being immortal is that, um, you know, there are certain things that are a slow burn and certain things that aren't, this one's sort of a medium burn. <laughs> um, and so it uh, takes place over, um, period of months, um, as she gathers, uh, or at least attempts to gather these three keys to power. And it'll become clear um, that what she has in mind for these keys is not good for the human race. Um, <laughs> beyond that, I'm not going to spoil much, but mm-hmm. uh, but I think that's fair to say that uh, if she succeeds, things don't look good for humanity. So, um, uh We'll have to see whether she gets what she's looking for. I figure Elise is probably going to be one of the first people to feel the 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 pain of that, <laughs> considering everything going on right now uh, in the uh, in the comics currently. Um, uh, yeah, she's not a big fan. Demona's not a big Elisa <laughs> fan. Um, uh, I'd say so. Um, that'll that could be an issue, um, but. Uh, Again, I, I'm, you know, I'm sort of notorious for not wanting to give spoilers. So, oh, yeah. um, no, we, we, we don't, we don't want more. to give up a, a, a single, a single spoil. We want, we don't want that. Um, I guess another thing I'm curious about too is with, uh, with everything else too that's been going on because, you know, Xanatos. Yeah, he's been making some moves in the background, uh, some stuff that, on his face to to the uninitiated would probably seem completely you know harmless but we know how xanatos is you know it, he's always got plans he's always got designs um especially with everything that happened recently in the i believe it was in the last two issues mm-hmm. uh specifically of gargoyles do we is there i guess are we gonna is what is anything with xanatos gonna factor in uh you especially considering his history with demona with a uh, gargoyles quest uh santos does not have a big role in quest this is okay. really i mean he you see him here and there but uh um uh and i'm sure that uh there's no love lost between demona and xanatos certainly um but uh i don't want to make it sound like oh this is another team up story uh mm. this is this is her story this is really i mean um you know 
we get Goliath, we get the gar the other gargoyles in there too. But this is really one where we're following Demona's machinations. Hmm. Um, it's much more from her point of view. I don't mean that literally, but mm -hmm. you know, it's much more uh, her carrying the story um, than our heroes carrying the story. And this is really her mission. It's not one that she either shares with Xanatos or is in, or is in oh. opposition with Xanatos. His involvement is uh, relatively minor in in this uh, five issue series. Um, mm -hmm. You know, is Xanatos got his own things going on? He absolutely has his own things going on, <laughs> but that that's not going to really come to fruition in in this uh, series. This one's really demonic mm -hmm. focused. Goliath, but it's got a lot of fun characters. <laughs> you know, we've got mm -hmm. a bunch of. Um, uh, I think we've got a bunch of. Uh, guest stars coming in <laughs> um you know uh that some will be surprising i think um and uh uh it's a pretty wild ride let me put it that way it's a pretty <laughs> it's, wild ride it's and it's international it's international like we oh. go hmm. we go i mean it, it's based in new york hmm. obviously but it it goes all over the world um to find these keys and um so it should be uh interesting and finding the keys isn't necessarily a straight line path though we go to this one then we pick up the second one then we pick, mm. it's much more complicated than that <laughs> uh but uh you know hopefully uh people will pick it up and it'll be uh i think it's like i said a pretty wild ride mm. So one thing I, I for sure have to ask, because I know you have to love the reception that you have gotten from everything that you have done with Gargoyles, with Dynamite so far. So did it. So what was that feeling? Because I know it had to feel really, really good to kind of you know put that old leather jacket back on and get back into that groove of things. So how was that feeling for you to just realize that so many people so so many people were just so just well receiving to these books and these stories uh it's incredibly gratifying what i'll say is um how do i put this i suspected as much um i've been telling <laughs> disney for years look you've got something here mm. let's do something with it um and uh, you know i'll say that um that hasn't you know there have been times when they've been sort of open to it mm -hmm. and times when they've been disinterested in it and even the times when they've been open to it they're like well yeah it could be something but you know it's this sort of niche property from the 90s um you know it we're not sure how big a following there is. And I'm sitting there going, I think there's a pretty big following. I think you're really underestimating it. So the fact that Gargoyles number one was Dynamite's best selling title ever hmm. um, was on the one hand, like I said, incredibly gratifying. Um, and uh, I was just thrilled. And yet there's a piece of me that's sort of like, see, told you, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, there's an, an aspect to this, you know, we did a Kickstarter to reprint uh, the old Marvel comics that were done in the nineties when the show was on and the, the two SLG sets that I did in 2007 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we raised over nine hundred thousand dollars on a Kickstarter that was asking for fifty k, mm -hmm. and um, again, still mad I Gargoyles missed that. Fans, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> Gargoyles fans are the best, but I'm also you know, so again, it's like wow, that is incredible. See, told you. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I can't. I have. I, I always have this kind of dual reaction to everything there's a piece of me that's obviously 
thrilled and and um, it's better than I thought it would be and all this sort of stuff. And then there's a piece of me that's that kind of felt like, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not kidding myself. I've worked on a lot of stuff. I've been doing this professionally since um, 1983. I've been in this business um, doing comics and cartoons and stuff for, you know, 40 years now. That's not nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, even when we were making Gargoyles in the mid 90s, I was aware that this was a unique property. It was a unique set of circumstances. It was the kind of thing that um, even at the time I was saying, you know, and I was like in my early 30s and it was the first show I ever produced. And I said, there's not going to be another one like this, you know, because it was original. I mean, Disney owns it, but that was an original property. It wasn't based on, I mean, I had a great time doing Star Wars and I've had a great time doing Spider-Man and a great time doing the entire DC universe and Young Justice, right? But this was an original property. I'm not saying it didn't have influences that came before, but it wasn't based on, you know, something specific. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, a really unique concept. And it had an incredibly talented group of people working on it. Um, everyone from my producing partner, Frank Parr, to this incredible cast of actors, Keith David, uh, Sally Richardson, Marina Sirtis, Jonathan Frakes, um, Tom Adcox, Jeff Bennett, Bill Fagerbaki, uh, Frank Welker, Bridget Bacco, John Reese davies um, I mean, the list goes on and on. We had Tony Shalhoub come in to do a one episode part. You know, we had David Warner come in to do what we thought was one episode part. He was so damn good. We're like, oh, we got to bring this guy back. And my voice director, I said this in the booth, and my voice director, Jamie Thomason, who's also fantastic, though don't tell him I said that. It'll go to his head. Um, <laughs> Jamie says, you just killed him off. How are you? how are you plan to bring him back? I said, I don't know yet, but I got to figure out a way because David <laughs> Warner's too good to not bring back in this role. And we did, you know, it, it, we had just this, and I don't want to pretend it was easy. You know, it was a lot of work. Um, we did, the first season was 13 episodes and we had a 10 month sliding schedule to do 13 episodes. And that was tough. It was doable, but it was tough. Then the second season was 52 episodes and we had a 10 month sliding schedule to do 52 episodes and it nearly killed us. Um, but even then, as hard as we were working and as tough as it was, we knew that this was something truly, um, truly unique and it doesn't come around every day. And so, like I said, you know, when I, Nothing thrills me more than being able to tell stories with these characters again. I love these characters. I love this world. And I got, where is it? I mean, I have these, you know, black and white composition books. <laughs> um, I have like a ton of these and full of uh, gargoyle story ideas. So for me, this is, is a joy. Um, whether it did well or not, it would be a joy to me. But, you know, on the one hand, I'm thrilled it did well. And on the other hand, I'm like, not surprised that it did well, because um, I think we've got this great group of fans out there for whom this show has a lot of meaning. And there are people who've discovered it, not just in 94, when it first came out, but discovered it, you know, years later on USA, when it was airing there, years later on uh, late at night, it aired on uh, Toon Disney and Disney XD, or they found it on DVD, <laughs> um, or they read the comics in the 2000s, um, or there's new fans now who started with the Dynamite stuff and and or found the show on Disney Plus. And so we have new fans all the time. We have, you know, second generation fans, you know, people who were kids or teens 30 years ago who have kids now and are showing gargoyles to their kids. And I love that. It's fantastic. Um, 
but I think it sort of proves the point that, uh, that, you know, this, this is kind of a timeless property. And, um, uh, and so, you know, I, uh, I'm repeating myself, but again, thrilled to be doing it <laughs> and not surprised that it's doing well. Let me ask you this, uh, in regards to, um, you know, cause we're, you know, we're talking about the, you know, the original animated series and, uh, and you know, continuity and jumping between that and to the you know to the Marvel comics SLG stuff up to Dynamite. Um, where uh, if someone were to you know come into you know, the Dynamite stuff, you know, obviously there's a lot of you know a lot of story that's come before. Uh, and I've always and I, I've I've heard mixed opinions on this. So yeah, you know, we're going straight to the source for this. Yeah, we've gone back and forth on this several times. Oh yeah, yeah oh multiple times. Yeah, you know, obviously first season, second season. Yeah, you know, duh. Where does the Goliath Chronicles, uh, or, or I think that's what it was called. I think it was mm -hmm. like it was a, mm -hmm. I it was a weird show for me because it felt kind of like a reboot, but also kind of like a continuation at the same time. Uh, I don't think it was designed as a reboot. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the the short answer is um, there were a lot of great talented people who worked on Goliath Chronicles who had um, an almost impossible schedule um, and um, a lack of support um, internally. And they literally had so little time. They didn't even have time to sort of familiarize themselves with the episodes that had come before with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, I have tremendous sympathy for them. Having said that, <laughs> I don't consider that um gargoyles chronicles season that aired not our first two seasons aired in syndication mm -hmm. um chronicles aired on abc saturday morning it had different s p restrictions it had an entirely different um set of showrunners some of the same writers stuck around and obviously the voice cast stuck around but i don't consider it canon i just sort of let's skip over that Likewise, I don't consider the Marvel comics canon. They were mm. fun stories. Um, there's some gorgeous artwork in there from Amanda Connor and others. Some fun stories from writers like Marty Pasco and others. People I respect. And it's not that I don't think it's good work. I do think it's good work, but it it's just not our show. Um, mm. uh, that book was being done while literally while I was producing the actual TV show. Oh, wow. And so I didn't have time to sort of truly uh, uh, supervise it in a way to make sure it fit continuity. And there's just stuff in there. Again, good stories worth reading, I would mm -hmm. say. There's just stuff that doesn't fit. And so for me, the canon of the series are the first two seasons, which is 65 episodes, which is a lot. And then the uh, 12 issues of Gargoyles that I did for SLG, the six issues of the spinoff series, Gargoyles Bad Guys that I did for SLG, and now the Dynamite stuff, which again includes 12 issues of Gargoyles, one Halloween special, six issues of Dark Ages, five issues of Quest, and there'll be more to come after that. But, um, but you know, it's that has the advantage for better or for worse of having one human being mm -hmm. consistently supervising it if you eliminate the marvel stuff plus there were you know random issues of disney adventures comics and there was a comics that they did for tv guide that you can find again all fun stuff i'm not knocking it <laughs> I, I i have tremendous respect for the people who worked on it but i wasn't supervising that so the stories sometimes the tone is wrong sometimes there's some you know factual error or there's a there's a a detail that's in direct contradiction with something in the canon um but if you stick to the first two seasons the slg stuff and the dynamite stuff um i can guarantee that that continuity is solid i'm not saying i never made a mistake or forgot something i'm sure i did probably more often than I'd want anyone to point out to me. But um, <laughs> but in any event, I'll take the blame for those errors. You know, and I, I, if there's stuff in there that doesn't hook up, and I don't think there's much, but if there is, you know, okay, that's on me. 
but I can't mm-hmm. take responsibility for stuff that I didn't work on at all. So for me, that's what the, what we, meaning me and the, and at the minimum, the hardcore fans the, define as <laughs> canon, mm-hmm. um, which again is not an argument not to go watch Goliath Chronicles or not to go read the old Marvel comics or the TV guide issue or whatever. Please do. It's more gargoyle stuff. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Um, But in terms of canon, we're just going to stick with, with what we've got. Rick Wiseman, I have to say that is the nicest way of giving someone their flowers, but also saying my shit's over here that I have. (laughs) (laughs) I commend you on that one, sir. (laughs) <laughs> thank you because <laughs> we we've actually we've talked about this uh previously uh carter and myself because you know it just it, when gargles comes up at you know, and usually we're doing this like on a live stream it almost mm-hmm. always comes up someone asks the question that's actually even why i've been asked uh, t- uh now because we had some people that send in some questions that's why i wanted to know but yeah it was one of those things like i i technically already knew the answer but i just wanted to make it make sure people saw straight i don't don't mind the source (laughs) but no i I, personally yeah i i think when when uh when the goliath chronicles came out i mean i did not enjoy it i mean yeah it was definitely yeah it was more gargoyles it was still fun something to watch on saturday morning i had a great time with and you know uh, you know why not uh, but I will definitely say I do agree with you that you know some of that edge that I feel like the original animated series kind of came out with because I remember being a kid and seeing the first commercial uh, for Gargoyles. Uh, I think at uh, at the time this was on uh, UPN here in Memphis, and I remember seeing the commercial. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. I didn't know what it was. I was like, yeah, I, I see like you know, what appears to be the perspective of something that is very clearly monstrous, <laughs> you know, looking you know, at somebody. And it was like, it's like, oh my God, I don't know what this is. And then you know, come to find out as time had passed and you know, finally the show had come out, and my eyes were not prepared for what it was that I saw. And you the the show is very timeless and, and at the same time very timely. Uh, because there are, yeah, and, and you know, these are elements that were in the animated series, you know, as you put it out there, but also even recently in the, in the Dynamite comics is the stuff that you know, I alluded to earlier with Goliath, like, hey, he, he was in prison and, you know, they're trying to figure out whether or not gargoyles or, you know, quotey fingers people, you know, like all mm-hmm. that stuff, all that commentary was something that I, I I was like, oh man, I forgot what this was like. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just you know what more uh you know I guess can people you know I guess hope to expect because you've never really shied away from you know social issues, uh social commentary or anything for that matter. Uh is there anything and not not saying it'll happen in you know gargoyles quest but just like in the core title uh as a whole um no i mean we we never shied away from it uh you know, people well certain people love to tell me that um i got woke and i've ruined the whole thing and and um you went woke and went is, broke is, that, that's what happened <laughs> my point is is that gargoyles was as woke as we knew how to be i didn't know that word back then but mm. in you know it, it has always been um, as progressive as we knew how to be, it hasn't changed. What I mean, what we're allowed to talk about has changed some. Um, but uh, you know, the the themes and stuff that we've been dealing with have, have been remarkably consistent. It's grown, I, I guess, uh, evolved a little bit, but uh, um, it hasn't changed, and it won't. You know, as long as I'm running the show so to speak uh you know that's uh what we have is a series with goliath sort of at at the hub of a wheel we have hundreds literally hundreds of characters in this world at this point um and they represent all sorts of different points of view um but goliath is at the hub of the wheel and goliath is fundamentally way more so than i am frankly an optimist And um, uh, he believes there's a way forward and he's, and he sets the tone for the, 
for the book. Um, even a title like Quest, which, like I said, is Demona focused, not Goliath focused. It's Demona in opposition to Demona's point of view in opposition to Goliath's point of view. Um, and it's not that she has no evidence on her side. As you mentioned earlier, the human race is very <laughs> problematic. <laughs> um, it's that, you know, uh, Goliath believes there's hope for humans and gargoyles to get along and and in time um, make things better, find justice, find equity, um, find empathy more than anything else. Goliath believes that. And so that's what will carry the title forward for as long as they let me do it. Um, and yeah, that's not going to, that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was important to me in 1994. It's even more important to me now. Um, and, uh, so the overall game plan hasn't changed. Like I said, I've got all these uh, comp books full of ideas, and some of those ideas are thirty years old at this point. I mean, we're <laughs> this is the thirtieth anniversary of Gargoyles this year, so um, which in and of itself is mind-boggling to me. I'm so old, <laughs> yeah. but um, but uh, but you know it's also sort of wonderful that it's the 30th anniversary and um and so yeah as long as they let me do it that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> well you know you, you, we just talked about uh <clears throat> wokeism uh you know because that that is uh a word i hear get thrown around way too much uh with no one capable of actually defining it um yeah <laughs> so one of the things I thought was pretty cool, and I actually am curious because I like I try to stay out of certain parts of discourse because otherwise I'll just be sad all the time. But it's a wise that's a wise, <laughs> yeah. wise plan. <laughs> we we I, I, I did not always stay out and, and in response I was hacked and my feed was destroyed for oh my uh, God. for two and a half months. But um oh, uh but uh so you you're smarter than I am. I'm gonna say. Um, well, I I just know that something Carter and I usually go back and forth about is how we usually try to stay out of comics Twitter and like cartoon oh, yes. and movie Twitter because we usually will end up saying something on there and then someone says something really stupid and we'll usually message each other and just be like, oh my god, yeah, I'm 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 putting this, I'm I'm deleting this app for a while so I can get the, you know, get yeah. the stupid out, but. <laughs> I, I was curious because you know I never really I, I tried not to keep up with it because I really didn't want to know but one of the things I really liked coming into uh you know, issue one on gargoyles was uh the relationship between Lexington and Stagheart mm -hmm. uh and I remember like when I like when like, you know because I actually I missed the um the initial run of the SLG stuff uh way mm -hmm. back. And so like I feel I was like, wow, wait a minute. I was like, did I, I was like, did I miss something? I was like, and yeah, you know, I went back, you know, digging and looking and it was like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, there we go. How has the response been on that? Cause I feel like Lexington, like it made like without you know, knowing, you know, going in, like it actually felt like the logical progression for Lexington as a character didn't feel like unnatural, but was there any, like, I guess, resistance so, to it? Uh, in the nineties, I remember sitting down, uh, with, uh, uh, at least one of my fellow story editors, Gary Sperling, um, I'm trying to think if there were other people in the room. I remember talking with Gary about it. Um, and uh, later talking with uh, Tom Adcox, who played Lexington. Um, and we decided that Lexington was gay. But in the world of 1990s cartoons, 
we couldn't do anything objective to um, reveal that. Mm -hmm. So we made a conscious decision. I mean, I guess I could have, I, I've admitted there's an element of cowardice here. Uh, I could have forced the issue, but I, I know what would have happened if I had just gotten that adamant about it. I just would have been fired. Mm. Um, and, and whoever took my place in order to demonstrate that they weren't following my path, they really, you know, make it clear how heterosexual Lexington was. Um, like so to the detriment seem, of the story. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that didn't seem to make sense to us. So what we decided to do is that we write him uh, as if he were gay, but without um, objectively revealing it. So that if and when down the road, the world got better, smarter, kinder, mm -hmm. we could reveal that he was gay and it wouldn't feel inconsistent with what we had written up to that point. And I've talked to many Gargoyles fans, um, both those who are uh, straight and those who are uh, um, LGBTQ, etc. And a lot of them guessed, even from the 90s stuff, that Lex was gay. Mm. And then somewhere at a convention, I revealed it. Um, at some point, you know, in between the TV series and the SLG books. And then by the time we got to SLG, you know, uh, I could be a little more straightforward about it without it being um, a problem. I still didn't kind of come out and say it because Disney was still a little gun shy, you know, 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. But now no big deal, which is good. Right. Um, and I think what's nice is, is that the fans, uh, again, the, the majority of true Gargoyles fans have been, um, very positive about it. Um, very responsive. They want it more. I'm planning to do more. Um, not there yet because again, we want it to feel organic. We don't want it to, you know, um, feel forced. Um, but, uh, everyone is. So far, well, I shouldn't say everyone because I, I know for a fact not everyone. But, um, but Trust the me, majority... I've heard a little bit of the discourse. Just, just just enough has snuck through. I know that there are some people who are upset. But I'm not one right. of them. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are some people who are upset. And my reaction to that is that that's too bad for them. I mean, you know, it it... it um, it's not changing my plans at all. Um, you know, like I said, I, I, I hope for a smarter, kinder world. And in some ways we've improved. And in other ways, we're, you know, there's been a reaction to that improvement that's, you know, less smart and less kind. And and uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, there's a word for it that I can't summon up right now because um, my brain doesn't always work. But uh <laughs> But yeah, you know, it, you know, we make progress. They react negatively to that progress. Guess it's a process, but uh, it's frustrating. But you know, for the most part, in terms of people who I think of as real Gargoyle fans, the the ones who get the show, um, they feel good about it, um, and uh, and I'm happy about that. Um, you know, it's. Uh, a start anyway. <laughs> hmm. I, I think it's safe to say Gargoyles fans are by and large pretty the, on the level. They're the best. Oh yeah. They're, they're, they're like, it's a, it, it always, it made me very like both, you know, yeah. Like sometimes when there's something you're a fan of, it always makes you feel bad when like, you know, it's like, Oh wait, the, you know, the people who love this, they don't get it. And it's like, I never felt that way with Gargoyles. Like, you know, mm. it's kind of like, a, you know, we had the recent discourse with X-Men recently where people are like, oh my God, X-Men's woke now. And it's like, where where have you been? You yeah. Know, it's like, you, I feel like Gargoyles is kind of the same. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was literally was designed. I mean, again, <laughs> no one had the word woke in the 60s when <laughs> X-Men premiered. But literally, you know, this is about a... a 
a persecuted minority. Mm -hmm. You can't get more woke <laughs> than that. It's a metaphor. <laughs> it's a metaphor. You know, I mean, people who look at X Men and and think that it's gotten woke and wasn't woke before, it's like, okay, either you, well, probably all these things are true. A, you don't know what the word woke means. You, right. You've defined it based on what you want to define it, but it's that's not what it means. That's A. B, you clearly have no true awareness of those old X-Men comics because they were, from day one, a metaphor about a persecuted minority. Um, and it's couldn't be any more obvious. I mean, it's, just, it's nuts to me. Or people who say Star Trek's gotten woke. I'm like, have you seen any episode with Kirk in it? Anyone? I just watched one last night. It was flipping channels, and there it was. You know, Kirk uh, stops a war, you know, and because, and there, it's like, uh, yeah, that's progressive warfare fucking sucks man so we but and and you're just sitting there going what show were you watching dude uh um, had universal basic income you know uh, universal health care no one actually had to like work a job if they didn't really want to and every right. and, and there was food and resources for everyone i don't know how they didn't catch it but yeah, oh and every species and race of people just about are working together towards a common goal with the exception of a couple Right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's well, like, I mean, nah, not woke at all. Nope. Mm -mm. I mean, it's like, I, I mean, literally, it's people <laughs> who must be metaphor deficient. You know, on one level, mm -hmm. you should almost feel bad for them. They don't see it as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. They like and media literacy. Like, you know, it's like, uh, no, you see, uh, that's what happened when the Vulcans met the human. It's like, you understand there aren't actually Vulcans out there, right? I mean, you get that, right? <laughs> that, that, that that's a metaphor. That's what sci-fi is. It's a metaphor for our real lives. What are you talking about? And I'm like, okay, we're, we're not even, I can't, you know? I, I just, well, I, I mean, can't. even gargoyles, <laughs> like, you know, the gargoyles, are hated and fear because they look different. They are different. They're not, yeah, right. they're not, you know, quotey fingers people. Uh, right. yeah, it was that way in the dark ages, you know, era, you know, all the stuff we saw like the very beginning in the very first episode that there were people who were scared of them. And, and even though and, they had the capacity to be what, like everyone else, but that's a metaphor. <laughs> and, and that, it, well, and that's the thing I find. But don't scary. tell anyone. <laughs> well, you know, people say that. Oh man, they ever. Uh, I really, I wanted to like so and so TV show, movie, book, whatever, but I felt the message was too heavy handed. And I was like, I was like, the reason why they're making these messages heavy handed now is because you don't get it when they when they try to be subtle. <laughs> 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 it's like at least that's always my excuse i mean yeah maybe sure maybe there are some heavy-handed messages out there but i felt like there, there i never are, felt I'm beat sure, over the head but, you know right you know I, I you know the the basic thing that you know i often get accused of is well now it's all really heavy-handed i'm like no it's pretty much the same now maybe you <laughs> thought season one of young justice was heavy-handed no no season one of young justice was great it's seasons three and four that are heavy handed and awful. I'm like, they're not any different. It's the same two guys, me and Brandon doing the show. Um, and we haven't changed our method of storytelling whatsoever. What's bothering you is that we're including characters and um, people that we weren't allowed to include before. And it just mm -hmm. bothers you that they're there. Mm -hmm. that we're right we're allowed to let them be visible now mm -hmm. um and well, in certain situations like uh there's a episode i believe with uh that focused on rocket that i was actually very surprised got made because i was like yeah. it's not something people talk about like you know being dealing with being a well actually it wasn't just one episode i think it was actually like two or three episodes but like the idea of her having to compartmentalize being a mother to a child who is uh, autistic, also at the same time having to be a superhero and you know, having to juggle all this responsibility. And I was like, no one really talks about that sort of stuff. Like, you know, 
Yeah, it, I, I thought that was, you know, I, I, I thought mean, that was interesting. I did. I thought it was interesting too. I mean, we did a. It was a four episode arc and uh, about a, you know, and there was a lot of other things going on. We had new gods and green lanterns <laughs> and red lanterns and red and blue lanterns <laughs> and and um and time travel and kryptonians and all sorts of crazy ass shit in this four parter but fundamentally it's about um uh, a single mom whose uh child is wondrous and not what she was expecting mm-hmm simultaneously Hmm. and how does she reconcile her original expectations for uh, a neurotypical kid Mm -hmm. with the wonderful son that she has who's great but isn't neurotypical and like neurodivergent right so if what we were trying to show from her point of view and you know i got hit from all sides because it's like this isn't his story i'm like no it's not it's her story we will someday tell give us enough episodes we'll tell (laughs) his story too but this story was about her and her learning coming to terms with that uh separation of what she expected and what was there Mm -hmm. and um and it's rocky it's not like she's instantaneously good at Mm -hmm. um any more than she can instantaneously defeat the bad guys you know there it's a it's there's a struggle to it um and uh you know i i'm proud of those episodes i think they were worth telling i also again don't think it's any different from the kind of stuff we did in season one and two it's just (laughs) we're able to go into more depth because we were on max instead of on uh cartoon network Mm -hmm. and our show had aged with our audience in other Mm -hmm. words you know if you were watching young justice in season one that was over a decade ago Mm -hmm. if you were eight years old or even 12 years old in 2010 when young justice premiered by the time season four comes around, it's 2020, 10 years have passed in series time. You know, when we met Raquel, she was 15 years old. Now she's 25. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got a kid. She's 25. She's divorced. Um, She's the dad's involved in the kid's life, but she's a single mom. And she's got a high powered, difficult job with the Justice League Mm -hmm. that sends her you know, to another planet. Shit happens. You know? um, <laughs> and um, no, did we do that kind of in-depth four episode thing back in season one? No, we couldn't. Yeah. Um, because for a 10 year old, that would have been too uh, much. Mm-hmm. But for a 20 year old, I think they can handle it. And um, yeah, if we're being real, a lot of 40 year olds. <laughs> fine i mean look i'm 60 so uh you know uh but that's my point you know yeah. in other words uh same with gargoyles you know uh it, it, i expect an audience who was six in 1994 mm-hmm. is older now i expect <laughs> them to be older now <laughs> you know um it it, it seems like Time passes. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure if you were six and ninety-four, mm-hmm. you're probably thirty-six now, give or take a year. You know, mm-hmm. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people just frozen time and they're still six. <laughs> but I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I have a certain expectation that we can go a little deeper. Um I don't want to change what the show is, if it's Young Justice or Gargoyles or whatever. I don't want to change what it is, but I do feel um, that as the audience ages and matures, that the series can mature a bit with it and Mm. go deeper. Same Mm. stuff, but we're going to go into a little more depth than we were able to do back then. 
And look, for me, the model, I mean, uh, I, there are a lot of problems about J.K. Rowling that I don't want to get into. But, uh, <laughs> but look, when, when I understand. The first, when the first <laughs> Harry Potter books came out, my kids were little, mm-hmm. you know, and I read the first book first myself to see whether I thought it was appropriate. And I thought it was. So I read it to my kids. And as each book came out, I would read it to my kids and I'd do voices and stuff like that and all that. So by the time the seventh book came out, my kids were way old enough to read that stuff themselves, but we had fun. So I read it to them and that kind of thing. Now, if if the level of maturity that's in the seventh book had been in the first book, I would not have read that book to my kids when they were little. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would have said, this is a great book, but it's good. they're going to have to wait until they're old enough to be able to handle this. But by the time we got to the seventh book, my kids were older and they could handle it. They'd aged with Harry and Hermione and Ron, et cetera. And so it's that approach on a show like Young Justice or Gargoyles that I feel like um, that's fair game, put it that mm. way. and. Mm. Uh, um, and so without changing the tone or the nature of the series, I do think it's fair game to, to be able to take it deeper and to be able to, um, create, uh, a more mature storytelling process than, um, we might've used on day one. Mm-hmm. but our audience is aged with us. So I think it's okay. Hmm. Well, I was, I was going to say, I would be more concerned if, if, if you didn't, if you went the opposite direction, I would be infinitely more concerned. Uh, so I, I am happy. That, well, I try you know. to make it stupider with each issue, but it, it, sometimes. <laughs> it's like, no, just throw all the stuff here, throw it all in. Just throw the whole toy chest in there. I mean, <laughs> with, with everything we've heard, I think it is it is more than safe to say that this series, just everything surrounding Gargoyles is most certainly in safe hands. Huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, at least, it's, at least it's in consistent hands. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. like, I'm not going to say safe. I'm not going to say safe. Just I, don't consistent. Know. I don't know how safe, but, uh, but, the, but I'm the, you know, if you liked it, in 94 if you liked it in 2008 you're gonna still like it um i would think um because i'm the same guy uh you know uh i like to think it's in safe hands uh with me um and certainly there are a lot of people out there who care a great deal about bargains and i'd still venture to say that no one cares about it more than i do uh, <laughs> and uh, uh you know i am passionate about these characters i i really uh care about them um they're very real to me we used to talk even back again in the 90s like things were firing on sort of all cylinders even back then to the point where I used to talk about the Gargoyles universe being out there and that what we were doing wasn't that brilliant. We were just tapping in somehow the stories from the real Gargoyles universe were coming to us because it all just seemed to always fit together. All the, like a puzzle where they were missing pieces and then we'd find a piece and we'd put it down and that would be the next story. But it always seemed to fit just so perfectly. And that's still sort of true. I mean, one of the things And I think this, you know, in a lot of stuff I've worked on, um, you know when it's working well when the characters start telling you what they want to do next. Um, Mm. That, you know, you don't have to go, well, what am I going to do with him now? You know what you're going to do with him because this is what that character would do next. And um, that's always been true, not on everything I've ever worked on, but on all the things that really felt like they were working and and one of the things for sure that's that's always been true about gargoyles um that we get got going there and pretty soon you know you know what angela would do next you know what demona would do next you know what goliath would do next you don't have to guess at it 
you don't have to manufacture stuff. Um, you know, I, I may have to come up with a line of dialogue, but in terms of, <laughs> you know, but in terms of their basic motivations are so clear, their goals and their desires are so clear where they come into opposition. You just sort of let them loose these characters and stories just fucking emerge. I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't even, it's not rocket science. You know, I mean, it, it just, <laughs> it is, um, the stories are where the characters take us because this is a great, really great group of characters. And look, I'm cheating all the time because I have the, the voices of the actors in my head. So even like <laughs> writing dialogue um, is so much easier. You know, if you're doing a comic book from scratch um, or, you know, I've written novels, you, you know, you do that, you, you try and get the voice of each character in your head and it's sometimes easier than others. But on Gargoyles, I've got Keith David's voice in my head. I've got Ed Asner's voice in my head. I miss it <laughs> terribly, but you know, his voice is still present for me. So when I'm writing Hudson, I'm hearing Ed Asner doing that Scottish accent. <laughs> um, you know, he was fantastic Mar- in that role. Yeah. I, you know, I hear Marina Sirtis, I hear Brent Spiner, Jonathan Frakes, um, Tom Adcox, the whole group. Um, and that makes the writing of it pretty easy because I know what they sound like. I know what they'd say. Uh, I know what they want. I know what they do. I don't have to work it. You know, there's certain things I've done in my career where, God, I have to work this. This is this is <laughs> like pulling teeth. This is hard. I'm, I'm struggling. That's not true with gargoyles. It's never been true with gargoyles. It, there's always been a flow to it. And again, people ask me or have asked me, well, where does it end? And I'm like, it, it, it doesn't end. And they're like, <laughs> well, then that's not as... All good stories have an end. I'm like, I guess if you say so, but this doesn't. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, the end comes when the book gets canceled until the next book starts up or the next show starts up. From my point of view, um, because this isn't, you know, if the show was titled Goliath, mm-hmm. then I guess it would end when Goliath ends. But that's not the title of the show. The title mm-hmm. of the show is Gargoyles. So as long as there's two gargoyles left alive somewhere um we're gonna keep going um (laughs) and uh uh, you know as long as they let me well i I hope it's not really up to me (laughs) i hope they let you for for many more years to come because you've done a fantastic job (laughs) there's no way i'll ever I'm going to die before I run out of stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, as many as those little comp books that you said you had, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think, I think we don't have to worry about there ever being any, uh, uh, gargoyle stories. Yeah. Oh man, we're running light. We're running light on, on, on what to do. Like, I don't think we have to worry about that. Um, but, uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you for, you know, just sitting down, taking the time, uh, to talk to us about this, to talk to us about gargoyles, gargoyles quest, and you know everything in between. Um, I wanted to say if you know outside of gargoyles quest, because you know we, we know we have that coming up. I believe that is uh this coming is April third. It's April. It's, I forget the date. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're looking at uh. Let's see here. I have it over here. Yeah, April 3rd. April 3rd coming up. So uh, not that far from it. I got a little less than uh, just under a month uh, uh, before this book drops. And, of course, uh, I'll be talking about it some more leading up to uh, its release. Um, And I want to say, yeah, if you haven't, for whatever reason, if you have not checked out, you have not checked out Dynamite's Gargoyles or Gargoyles Dark Ages, uh you've done yourself then what's wrong service. with you right truly, like truly. like what like what first off what are you doing like what are you doing with yeah. yourself like, like i mean act together <laughs> are you really are you really a gargoyles fan if you haven't done this yet i, I think i think you need to, i need you need to go get it just yeah as a long time gargoyles fan i'm uh, 
I'm over the moon for it. I love it. Every issue is fantastic, and you don't want to miss any of them. Uh, and Gargoyle's Quest, I am very excited for because I am a huge fan of Demona. So the more Demona I get to see, the happier I always am. Uh, so I highly advise go. Actually, don't don't walk. Run, run, run <laughs> to your local comic shop right now. Tell them to put this in your pull list, please. And thank you. Put all the gargoyle stuff uh, uh, in your pull list, please. Uh, and do you have anything else, any other upcoming projects uh, or you know, or even stuff that's already out that you want to plug? Uh, you know, please. Well, uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, which also comes out this month, issue one. Um, and I'm really excited about that again. Tremendous uh, work by Umberto Ramos on the book. Um, I think it's a lot of fun and uh, it's got, you know, a lot of stuff in it. You know, we've got a new supporting cast that we're building for the two of them because they've each got their own books with their own supporting cast. But So we're uh, having them hang out at the uh, Coffee Bean on the Empire State University campus and we're building a supporting cast there of new and old characters we've got a murder mystery we've got the jackal we've got uh, a lot of weird weird stuff going on <laughs> so i hope people pick up that book and then the other thing i'd like to promote um is the 30th anniversary of gargoyles is this year i mentioned that earlier and we are having a big party mm. uh, over the fourth of july weekend in minneapolis minnesota um at uh, Convergence, which is a great convention. I've been to many times. Uh, it uh, You can find it at convergencecon.org, something like that. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we've got, I'll be there. Uh, Keith David, the voice of Goliath, will be there. Hmm. Um, uh, Tom Adcox. The voice of Lexington will be there. Uh, Zara Fuzzle, the voice of Sherry, will be there. Um, and more that I'm just on the verge of being able to announce, but I can't, don't quite have it locked down yet. But it's a big, it, it, it's a really nice size con. It's not giant and overwhelming like San Diego, but it's not so tiny that like nothing's happening at it. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of stuff going on, but we're going to have a bunch of gargoyles panels learn about uh, how we uh, developed and sold the show, uh, learn about how we produced the show. Uh, um, we're going to have a radio play where uh, fans can audition and perform with uh, actors from the actual show. So we'll do a, a sort of oh, wow. goofy episode of Gargoyles uh, with, <laughs> you know, uh, with actual actors from the show. We're even having a pie contest. Uh, 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 who makes the best pie? Um, and, you know, we'll do a live podcast. We've got all this stuff going on there. Uh, again, there's more than just Gargoyles, but we do have this 30th anniversary celebration for Gargoyles there. Um, and so, you know, if you're a Gargoyles fan and you want to meet uh, some of the cast and crew, um, that's the best place to do it. Uh, Minneapolis over the 4th of July weekend this mm -hmm. year for the 30th anniversary of Gargoyles. July 4th through the 7th. Yeah, so there you go. You guys got the dates. I'm actually going to make sure uh, we got the link. I'm going to put the link down in the uh, description, uh, pin comment Thank below, you. all that good stuff, because I know that a lot of people in my audience – they're huge Gargoyles fans. I'm not and... even worried about the audience. We got a trip to plan. <laughs> yeah. we got a trip you guys should come. Look. <laughs> like, I, we look, do, I, we're doing I just... at least one live podcast. We there can you do go. your show, too. Hey, I, can, I can make it happen. You guys look, show. You, did I you hear that? He uh, already oh, no. told me that he made Gargoyles for me when I was six, and I'm about to be 36 this year. The show is mine. That's first thing. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm giddy right now. I am so giddy. I'm telling this to everybody who will hear it. <laughs> ownership, man. You've got ownership. Hey, dude, God, I never thought about it that way. Dude, yeah, now it's changed my entire perspective. Yeah, like, like oh, that, that's what I'm, doing. I'm just going to go around telling people, like, I'm, it's partially mine. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. You've got ownership. <laughs> 
You guessed it, obligatory channel outro time. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. Clicking that subscribe button and tapping that notification bell ensures that you get more videos just like this one and you don't miss any of my other content that I drop throughout the week, plus my live streams every Thursday and Saturday. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that like button, keep it plus ultra, and sound off in the comments.